Let's all bow our heads in prayer. Our holy and merciful Father in heaven, I thank you. Lord, we were deserving of eternal wrath and destruction, and yet, Lord, you brought us out of that place through your great and merciful love, and for that we thank you. Father God, we who have been saved and redeemed and sanctified through your precious blood have gathered here before you to sing praise to your name, to learn from your words, and to share fellowship. Lord, I thank you. Uh, Father God, I ask, and I, uh, I ask that you will be with us. Uh, Lord, we know and believe that you are indeed uh, with us this very moment. And Lord, um, uh, because of the ongoing pandemic, we are at a situation in which uh, all of our brothers and sisters cannot meet in the same place they partake of fellowship. Uh, Lord, wherever those brothers and sisters are, um, Lord, I ask that you will be with them likewise and that you will add to them the necessary measure of grace for our churches here and for many churches abroad. There are many brothers and sisters that are keeping, that are striving to keep their faith before you. Father God, please uphold them with your righteous right hand and keep them likewise. Father God, help them so they will be able to rely upon you, testify of your gospel truth, and likewise bring lost souls to salvation. Please help them perform this great work before you. And for those brothers and sisters that are in times of sickness, Lord, I ask that you'll restore their health to them so that they'll be able to live the rest of their days uh, with uh, in accordance to your glory and in accordance to your will. For those brothers and sisters who are in times of tribulation or hardship, Lord, I ask that you will likewise provide them with uh, the measure of your grace so that not one of them will fall away from this holy place of fellowship. Uh, Father God, I ask that you will continually provide us with your appointed words uh, so that we will be able to live in accordance to your ways, so that we will be renewed and revitalized uh, before you. Uh, please uh, be with us at this time in this regard. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will likewise be with us. Please give us the wisdom to discern your holy will. Uh, so that we will be able to live our lives, not for our own will, but for your gospel truth. Lord, I ask that you will be with us in all that you do, and I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Uh, we will now listen to the appointed praise. Thank you. 
Uh, let's open up our Bibles to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. That's in the New Testament. Romans chapter 8. Uh, Romans chapter 8 from verse 35 through 37. Romans chapter 8 from verse 35 through 37. Uh, let's read those verses uh, uh, together. From verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Up till there. Uh, yesterday, um, uh, in the uh, one of the northernmost parts of our country, um, a little uh, south of the 38th parallel in our church in Inje, we had a grand opening uh, for a church there. And... Um, I think we have a, a battalion that is stationed nearby. So there are many uh, brothers um, who are soldiers, likewise, that are uh, in regular attendance. Uh, and although, of course, it's a very difficult uh, situation and circumstance to uh, evangelize and preach the gospel, but I was able to see uh, the image of the brethren there said fastly preaching likewise and I was very thankful uh, to be able to bear witness uh, to such a thing and looking at upon uh, the you know the 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 brethren who were likewise soldiers I was reminded of the very fact that we are all likewise soldiers of Christ and yes, the soldiers upon this world fight for loyalty and, and uh, to protect their own country. Uh, however, we are soldiers of Christ, and we are those who ought to be fighting against sin, against this world, against the ways of this world. Uh, that is a spiritual warfare that we are waging. <clears throat> um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it is it is a... A church, of course, that is under a very difficult circumstances, but uh, the very fact that I was able to see them uh, steadfastly testifying of the gospel and living uh, steadfastly likewise for uh, the will of God, uh, that was something that filled me with great joy and likewise ought to be a source of great comfort for us all. Um, in fact, for those of us who are living our Christian lives in relative comfort, and perhaps a safety. Uh, and if we are unable to live our Christian lives, despite the fact that we are in the midst of such choice comforts, we ought to be ashamed. Uh, we have been continuing our study of how we, uh, we can be filled with the Spirit. And we have likewise been testifying or learning about how uh, we as Christians ought to live our lives. Of course, uh, when we first realized or when we first received salvation, it was through the realization that uh, we were sinners condemned to an eternity in hell. And it was our faith in what Jesus Christ had accomplished upon the cross that we were uh, saved and redeemed uh, without any price that we had to pay. Salvation is a gift. Uh, there is nothing that, there is no fee that needs to be paid. 
There is no amount of effort that needs to be given. Uh, it is the wholesome gift of God uh, that we can receive of open arms. However, uh, our Christian lives after we have received salvation is not likewise. We are now children of God. We are now Christians in the sight of God. We are um, children of heaven. We may be living upon this world, but as Christ himself said, you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Uh, Born-again Christians, likewise... Right, They were moved from Adam to Christ. They were moved from death to life. And yes, we who used to live within this world were called into the church, which is the body of Christ. Now our lives uh, have been changed into that which is eternal, which is eternal. And we have a surefire purpose and promise that we are held by. Uh, um, that is why the life that we must live and ought to live uh, has to be different than uh, the ways in which the people of this world live. And the more we study the Bible, the more that becomes abundantly clear. Now, even if you think and ponder upon the very fact that we are indeed children of God, uh, you know, this is not something that was... Uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, um, it, 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 it is a marvelous fact uh, that has been revealed to us, a marvelous truth, right? Um, we, you know, Christ himself um, made us his tr uh, children of God. Uh, and that is an amazing truth, an amazing a spiritual privilege and a spiritual right that has been passed upon us. Uh, the very fact that we are now children of God. Right. Although that um, may not be immediately or readily apparent, uh, you know, for example, a child when he is born, uh, if he is of royalty or if he is born of an influential or afflu uh, affluent family, he may not know that he has uh, uh, of such privileges. However, once he becomes of age, uh, once he grows older and older, Right, uh, he is able to realize uh, that um, uh, that he has a position of a prince, and that he will be a king one day, and that there are these privileges and likewise his responsibilities that he will be held held accountable to. Of course, uh, yes, we are children of God, and of course, at first it may not be readily apparent. Um, sometimes it may, you know, we, we go out into the same world that other people in the world do and we toil away uh, as other people in the world do. But we know that our life is different, our hope is different, our purpose is different, um, our, uh, our, our eternity likewise is different. And the more we grow in spirit and the more we grow uh, in, in terms of how we ought to be living our Christian lives, uh, we will learn what it means to be a child of God. And... Uh, God himself will teach us uh, the life that we ought to live and should be living as Christians before him. Um, it is a certain thing. It is a certain thing that we are different from the people of this world. We will change. We will exude and display that change. You know, you know. Um, let's say there's someone who is saved or says he is saved, and and yet uh, he is no different uh, from the ways of everyone else within this world, right? Or yeah, at least that's what it seems. Well, that cannot be so because a, a born again Christian, although that change not be seen with our eyes immediately, we are of a new life. The very fact that we are saved, what that means is that the Spirit of Christ now dwells within us. God himself now dwells within us. It is God and the Spirit that now dwells within each and every one of our hearts as born-again Christians. And although some Christians do know this and are aware of this, they forget the fact that they are child, children of God. They forget the fact that they are citizens of Christ and citizens of heaven, and they live their lives in accordance with their ways and accordance with the ways of this world. Um, that is... a. Uh, uh, right, that is uh, someone who is um, who is uh, despising the Holy Spirit. He that is someone who is ignoring God who dwells within their hearts. Is that not true? And that cannot stand. That cannot be. 
As Christians, we must boldly proclaim the gospel. We must live in accordance to the words of God. And yes, although we were saved through the grace of God, through the unconditional love of God, without a price, however, th- from the moment we are saved until the time until we enter into the kingdom of heaven, the life of a Christian is not an easy thing, nor is it freely given. It is difficult. It is hard. Not only is it difficult, God is with us likewise. And it is the power of the Holy Spirit that provides us with the strength to live in accordance to those words. And because of this, once I know and I realize this, I will be able to receive strength. There is need for me to learn what it means to live the life of a Christian. You know, let's say, oh, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sundays and I sing hymnals and I pray and I, you know, listen to the prayer, um, the sermon. And then uh, and then uh, I, I, I give some offerings and I'm thankful. Uh, well, let's be perfectly honest. That is a very, very small part of what a Christian should be and ought to be doing. Right, if a Christian says does those things and then for the rest of the week lives their lives in accordance to how they see fit, then that is a zero in the eyes of God. That is not right in the eyes of God. As Christians, we are those for whom, uh, you know, we have Christ at our side. We ought to serve Christ and uh, daily. We ought to forsake the things that are of this world uh, daily and fight against sin and fight against Satan. And yet that is not an easy task. That is by no means easy. That is difficult. And we almost must be in a position, uh, have an awareness that we will, so that we will be able to fight at whatever notice is given. You know, in... Uh, you know, let's say if if you're a soldier, right, right, and and you are and you are given the watch duty, let's say you're a soldier in the thirtieth parallel, and you're given the watch duty, right? Can you fall asleep? No, that is a responsibility that is given especially for you, right, under threat of death, right, uh, and that is something you must keep no matter how difficult it may be. Right, uh, Christ Jesus died upon the cross so that we would be able to live. In Colossians chapter two, verse fifteen, it says he triumphed over them in it with the cross. Right, Satan might have thought, "I have crucified the Son of God. I have won." But who emerged victorious when Christ died upon the cross? Was it Satan? No, it was not. Right, uh, in Genesis it says that the the uh, that the serpent, um, the serpent, right. Uh, would be bruised with the heel of man, right? That the descendants of women would bruise the heels uh, with their heels, broom, or crush the skull of Satan, right? That, that, that's, what, uh, that's what the Bible says <coughs> uh, they would be able to do. You know, people might think, oh, you know, Jesus said he was a son of God, but yet he lived this accursed life. Uh, he lived in a cursed life and death because he was crucified in such a pitiful manner. And yes, that might be the case to those who do not understand. But for we who are born again, we know that the Christ, the cross of Christ is the greatest victory of all. Right. Um you know, if we, you know, some some people might think that Christians are very pitiable and stupid, but that is not the case at all. It is Christ who dwells within us, and we are able to wage war against Satan and against this world, and we are sitting at this very pinnacle, in w- uh, 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 this very critical place in which we can learn and move forward and live a life of victory before God. Christian life itself, Christian life itself. Uh, is not um, possible merely through our own efforts and through our own knowledge and our own zeal. Uh, <clears throat> In First Peter chapter 5, it says, Because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may require. Yes, your adversary the devil, it says. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Right? Uh, The people of this world are already underneath the dominion of Satan. 
And just because, you know, uh, they are saved, or just because we who are saved are saved, you know, does not mean that they leave us be, right? That the people of this world do not simply leave us be uh, as born-again Christians. And Satan himself does not leave us be. He roars about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan has no sleep. He has no time to sleep. He is too busy seeking us out so that he can ruin our life, right? It can be very easy for a Christian to fall completely under the wiles of Satan, right? Um, there is suffering that comes to those who are on the battlefield, for those who are at the position of war. Um, now, in, in India, I saw that, uh, right, uh, It was uh, there was a, quite a very uh, a, a good view uh, at the residence that I was at. Um, and the pastor's name was a very good name. It was... Um, uh, Charil, uh, which uh, kind of uh, means a, mo <laughs> a bit more in Korean than it does in English, unfortunately. Right. I guess in English it would be Iron Man. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, that that's the closest uh, uh, interpretation I could find. In any case, it was a pretty good name. I didn't tell him it was a good name, but it was a pretty good name. Um... You know, during the uh, Korean War, um, you know, when, you know, the communists came all the way down, I believe, to Busan, and then through the Incheon Offensive, um, we were able to push back the communist forces up until the border, uh, and then, of course, they eventually uh, fought their way back until a stalemate, but there were many, many UN ground forces uh, that, were, that died uh, defending, uh, defending South Korea. And uh, the the battles at wage were, uh, you know, exceedingly fierce, and uh, there were many, many, uh, many, many UN forces that perished and died upon the battlefield. Uh, some of which I was able to see. You know, some must have uh, drowned in the river. Uh, some must have been shot. Some must have, uh, you know, and so on and so forth, and so on and so forth. And there was a, a American soldier who had gotten wounded at the battlefield. And um, he had left a request to his wife back in America before he died. He said, if there had been a bridge at this river, which they were fighting at, many the lives of many people would not have been lost. But because there was no river, there were many soldiers whose lives were lost here. So um, use all the possessions you have if, and build a bridge here. And his wife, uh, many years after many years, uh, used all the money that she had. And there had not been a bridge uh, built up until that time. Uh, she she used all the possessions, the money that she had, and and of course that bridge was built, um, and of course the build was usually uh, was uh, built, and uh, the and and uh, and uh, the, the and uh, in on, on the bridge you're able to see the you know statues of the UN forces. Um, upon that bridge in commemoration, right? Soldiers from all over the world came to this country of ours to to not just protect this country, but to fight against the forces of communism and 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 and, and for peace, right? Uh, the UN soldiers were soldiers that fought for peace. And if you think about the many soldiers that died, it was such a, um, an emotional moment for me, right? In the same way. Uh, for this gospel to have been preached and for this bridge of the gospel to finally be able to reach us let's 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 ask ourselves just how many soldiers of Christ sacrifice themselves against uh, Satan sacrifice themselves uh, and died so that the gospel could be preached to us and that fight is a fight that we ought to fight even now even still in Colossians Right or, or or Philippians, not Colossians. It says, uh, having the same conflict. Uh, Philippians chapter one verse thirty, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me, 
This fight has not ended. This fight is still very much here. There is a war that is being fought against the forces of Satan. And there is great suffering, great sacrifice that needs to be made. And yes, yes, perhaps even to the point of death, even to the point of losing your life. And when I was, uh, you know, in India and looking at all the sites and, uh, you know, the the, the land, uh, the battlefields that were, uh, not just the many Koreans, but the many sons of foreign families of foreign countries um, that died and perished there. Right. I was very emotional, but I also reminded myself that our spiritual warfare and our spiritual battle uh, had not ended yet. Uh, that is why the life of a Christian is war against Satan and this world. I said this before. I said this before, right? Um, uh, we must abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. We are fighting against the lusts of the flesh. We are fighting against ourselves. We are fighting against this world, against sin, against all the, the forces of darkness within this world. However, this, this warfare, this, this war, right? Uh, before uh, soldiers go off to war, they are trained. And they are trained because a soldier who is trained has strength to overcome things that a normal person cannot. Even uh, at the face of death, uh, they are able to perform their duty. They are able to fight against enemies that are stronger than them and emerge victorious. A trained soldier is able to do so. We as born-again Christians have been trained by God. Our being trained by God this very moment then God gives us power and ability. Yes, when, when an army is said, not only is this army trained, uh, all, all the things that the soldiers need, whether it be equipment or weapons or, or vehicles or, or so on and so forth, all the things that a soldier needs to be able to fight is given to them. And in the same way, God has prepared everything for us, everything that we need to, to be able to preach the gospel. God is fighting alongside with us. This is why this is something we have to really think about. Our warfare is not complete. This war is not yet over. This spiritual warfare, this battle, this war that we are waging and fighting against Satan, against this world, this battle is still very much going on. And there is suffering that we as born-again Christians ought to partake in that war, that battle, and it is Christ who works in the midst of that likewise. Uh, that is why Satan, uh, next to God, is uh, exceedingly wise and exceedingly strong, and because of this, uh, it's impossible for us to overcome Satan along, uh, simply on our own. Uh, Marvin Luther, uh, I, I, I think, uh, when he was fighting against uh, the Catholic Church, he risked his own life, because Marvin Luther... Um, there is a, 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 a hymnal uh, that he writes, and he says, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to do undo us, we will not fear, for God have willed his truth to triumph through us. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. Thus ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Yes, we cannot rely upon our own strength to fight against the wise of Satan. This is impossible. But if we have faith in God, in Christ, then it is Christ who will fight our battles. It is Christ who will fight in our stead. For God is the creator. He is a king of kings and he is a lord of lords. It is he who is with us. It is he who will fight for us. Yeah. However, yes, uh, 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 yes, God has sent us out to wage war uh, against these, uh, against the wiles of Satan, and He is watching over the fight that we wage. Um, and I did speak about this uh, uh, the last time we covered this topic, but regarding this battle, this war, this uh, this of uh, spiritual warfare, yes, there are many uh, sufferings and sacrifices that must come about, um, but the apostles, right? And amongst them, uh, Apostle Paul, for example, uh, Apostle Paul was fighting, I guess, in our, uh, uh, you know, modern day, 
uh, equivalent would be at the front lines of the battlefield, right? Um, at the at, at the at the at the very forefront of the battlefield, um, you know, you know, you know, uh, you know, when a battle is being waged, there is a general that is, you know, watching everything that is observing from far away, and then he gives the order to go forth, and then the the the, the captains and the corresponding sergeants uh, relay that order to strike, to go forward, and they run to the enemy. They all go uh, get up and they run towards the enemy in obedience to the orders that have been given. If if their friends get shot and they die right they 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 leap over that corpse because that order has been given we, we that side is something that is uh, uh i'm sure is something that is familiar to us and that is a fight that we are fighting right now just l let us imagine such a battle for we are waging that battle it is christ who is at the very forefront who is at the very forefront who is fighting and uh, there are many those who have followed after him you know the, the apostles uh paul Likewise, Peter, likewise, we know how Apostle Paul fought. He said, I fought a good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. I have kept the faith, he said. Yes, I have kept the faith. I have uh, emerged victorious in this world. If you are victorious in this world, they give you a medal. Uh, so, you know, a medal of honor, some some order of merit. And it's a great glory to say uh, the soldier that is be, uh, for which it is being received. Then of course I'm sure it is. It'll be, you know, glorious for the family members uh, of that particular soldier. But in the end of the day, it is merely a medal. Some people say it's just a a piece of metal and a, on on stuck on a piece of cloth. However, the glory that we shall receive in heaven is not akin to the glories, the medals that we shall receive upon this world, right? He who is victorious has sat down on the right hand side of God. Right, uh, we are those who have been given. Uh, uh, you know, right, he has sat down on the right hand side of God. Right, uh, uh, there is a separate glory that is provided for those who will emerge victorious. Right, Apostle Paul said himself, "There is a crown of righteousness that is waiting for me, and that righteous judge on that day will be granted to me, although we may, I may have received the same salvation." Right. Um, uh, there is a very big difference between those who have fought to the death and emerged victorious and those who stayed in the back. You know, how can the glory that uh, those two people receive in the battlefield be the same, be one and the same? You know, in terms of Christian life, uh, in terms of our Christian life, whether it be evangelism or whatever else, right? Uh, if I do not do it, someone else will, right? If I, you know, live in accordance to my own choice comforts at a time of battlefield, at a time of warfare, I will run away in fear. Ask yourself if that is true. It is. It surely is, right? When other soldiers are bleeding, why am I sitting here and and and, and in my in my comfort, right? Isn't that I am I not displaying the attitude of someone who has quite simply uh, run off uh, from the battlefield in a shameful manner. Christ is indeed watching all, and there are many, many fights for us to wage. Uh, in Romans chapter 8, in Romans chapter 8, it describes to us what the fight is. Um, yes, when the people of Israel were uh, being brought out of Egypt in the Exodus, and they traversed in the wilderness for 40 years where they were trained. And when they went into the land of Canaan, no, they did not simply go into the land of Canaan. They had to go into the land of Canaan and overtake it and fight. There were great giants. There were seven tribes of Canaanites living in the land of Canaan. Joshua, uh, Joshua, uh, uh, when, he, when he, he, he gathered the people of Israel and he went into the land of Canaan, they, they fought against the seven tribes of Canaan and they cast them out and they overcame and encompassed the land. That land was theirs to take. And Canaan is representative of the kingdom of heaven and the life that we as born-again Christians live. You know, of course, uh, you, you know, uh, the... Uh, what do you call it? The, the wilderness is the fight that we wage against ourselves. Um, and once all those who had who had come from Egypt had died, those who had emerged out of Egypt as young children, with that new generation and with the children that had been born within the, the, uh, within, uh, the 40 years they spent in the wilderness, that spoke of how um, 
Yes, my old man had died, and how they were reborn as a new man in Christ. New, those who were newly raised within Christ. What is, what is it speaking of? It's speaking of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. We must seek, and we must encompass the land of Canaan. If you look at this here, if you look at this here, uh, Apostle Paul uh, when he talks about this fight and this fight and this fight that must be fought for us to win, there are seven things that are uh, labeled here as well, which we'll study together later. Right? There is a war that is being waged, and that war will not simply unravel on its own. In verse 31, verse 31 to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Oh, my apologies, I read the wrong verse. It's chapter 8, verse 31. It says here, What then shall we say to these things? Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, then who can be against us? If God himself is for us, if God himself is for us, then who can be against us? In Joshua chapter 23, verse 10, it says, It is the Lord your God is he who fights for you. The Lord your God is he who fights for you. If God who is fighting for you is for us, and who shall be against us, and who shall rise up against me? Right? Those words are words of strength. Those words fill me with passion and zeal, especially when I hear it in English. One man of you shall chase a thousand. Right? One man of you shall chase a thousand, Scripture says. For it is the Lord your God is he who fights for you. If God is at your side, then whether you fight against a thousand or ten thousand or a hundred thousand, who will rise up against you? And furthermore, in Romans chapter 8 verse 33, it says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? These are bold words indeed. Right, it says here, who brings a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Yes, Satan compelling us to sin continues to bring a charge against us. Oh, this person is in this, he's stolen this, and he's uh, committed adultery, and he sinned this, and this way and that way, and so on and so forth. You know, Job, although he was righteous, uh, Satan went before God and said, you know, Job, well, he's very prideful and he does this and this. Right? He was uh, someone who sought the seed with his words. However, Jesus Christ died upon the cross for all of our sins. He is our mediator in heaven for us. And now those who believe in Christ are righteous. So who shall bring a charge against us now? Who shall bring a charge against the God's elect? Who will? These are bold words indeed. Our salvation is bold. Our salvation has was accomplished by Christ once and for all. For all of eternity we are made righteous in the eyes of God. Who shall bring a charge against us? Who shall dare bring a charge against us? Who will bring a charge against us, Scripture says? Who? These are bold words indeed. This is a certainty we have in our salvation. This is a certainty that we must have in our salvation. And furthermore... Furthermore, it says, right, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Right? It is Christ who sits at the right hand side of God, praying for us, making intercession for us. Therefore, who shall rise against us? Who shall condemn us? Who shall be against us if this is so? Which it is. We are underneath the grace of God. We are underneath the power of God. And that is where we have security. Uh, let's go to verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Romans chapter 8, verse 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Yes, we are children of God. God forsook his glory, and he came into this world into the form of a man. 
He forsook his glory. He forsook his heavenly crown. And he came into this sinful and wicked world. He came himself in the form of a man. And he endured all the pain and hardship that a man possibly could. He who had no sin was ridiculed and spat upon and judged by sinners. He was ridiculed. He was stripped naked and bare. He was whipped until he had wounds all over his body. And he bore a cross and a crown of thorn upon his head. And went to Golgotha. And he was crucified upon that cross. And he died. Why? Why? For us. He took upon the judgment that we should have received. He took upon the suffering that we should have received. And through his precious blood our sins are washed away once and for all. That we would no longer be condemned anymore. And he resurrected on the third day to give us a living hope. And it is he who still makes intercession for us. If you think about that grace that we have received. You think about the grace of God and the love of Christ. In Romans chapter 8, verse 32, it likewise says, in verse 32, it likewise says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Right? What is there that he will not be able to give us? It is through faith and that love that we were redeemed. It is through faith and that love we have received salvation. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says, We have known and believed the love that God has for us. We have known and believed in that love. We have known and believed. We have known and believed in the love of God and the grace of God. And that is what has saved us. We have known and we have believed God indeed is love. That is why we also can love God. Right? Jesus loves me, and I know I love him. Love brought him down, my poor soul, to redeem. Yes, it was love made him die on the tree. Oh, I am certain Jesus loves me because of this. Because of this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, it says, For the love of Christ compels us, because, if, because we judged us, for that if one died, then all died. I am now, what, compelled by the love of Christ. Yes. It is because of the love of Christ we do not love the world. It is because of the love of Christ we hate the sin of this world. It is because of the love of Christ we listen and we are obedient to the words of God. And because we love Christ, no matter what sufferings and tribulations may we may encounter, we can be victorious. It is because of the love of Christ... We can fight against the wiles of Satan. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It says. Yes. We are. Yes, in this war that is waging between Satan and, and us. But we are holding upon the power of God and the grace of God. And that is why there is need for us to be filled with the Spirit, filled with the love of God, filled with the Word of God. Yes, these things are needed and necessary. Yes, we must fill ourselves with the characters of Christ. We must fill ourselves with the ability and the strength of God. That is what it means to be filled. We must be filled. If I'm not filled with the Holy Spirit, a, a, born, a Christian cannot live in accordance to the words of God if he is not filled with the Holy Spirit. And to be filled with the Holy Spirit is not something special that is, uh, that, that, is, that is given to us. It is not reserved for a special type of Christian. That is normal. That is normal. Yes, you know, a person is born within this world and he is taught in the ways of this world and he lives in accordance with the ways of this world, and yet there are some people who are born within this world, but they live their lives like animals. They are born in abnormal situations, in abnormal circumstances, and we live in a time and age in which there are more people who live abnormally than normally. In fact, what is abnormal has become normal because there are more people who are abnormal in our world in this day and age. 
uh, right? You know, you know, you know. They they say that um, in a, you know, you know, you know, you know, in a village filled with one-eyed people, a two-eyed person came and they all ridiculed him and said he was uh, a strange person, so he had to take his eye out. But who was the one? Who were the ones who were very foolish? It was all the other people who only had one eye. Yes, the world thinks of us in that way. They think of us as fools, as idiots. But who are the true fools? Who are those who are truly in the wrong? Wait and see what will happen. Truth will always be revealed in time. Yes, in order for us to live a proper Christian life, and that is something that we must seek. We must seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We must seek to live a Christian life that is proper and upright in the sight of God. Because we can only live a normal Christian life when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. There are so many people in the world in this day and age who are not of right mind, of right heart, and they are, you know, very lukewarm, right? And yet, although you may be weak in the flesh, right? Although you may be weak physically, as Christians, we must be strong in Christ, and our 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 our, our hearts towards God must be certain, must be assured. And must be certain, right? <clears throat> uh, right to 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 fix ourselves upon a singular purpose, upon a singular goal, not turning to the right hand or to the left, right? To simply go forward towards that destination and towards that goal. Christian life is likewise. There are some people who, at some times, it seems like they're living the Christian life, and then they sometimes it seems like they're not, and they come back to God, and then they go away from God. What do you think God will look at, or what do you think God will say? He's going to say, when are you going to grow up? When are you going to live your Christian life properly? When, indeed, are you going to live properly for me? This cannot be so. If this is my case right now, yes, of course, you know, if, you know, there are people for whom it's been years since they were saved and they think that they've, they've uh, grown to whatever extent, but that is wrong. That is not right. Just because years have passed since you were saved does not necessarily mean you are a more, a more mature Christian. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? It says, why does it say this? Why does it attest to this? Because Satan tries to rob our hearts of the love of Christ. He tries to separate ourselves from the love of Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says, Apostle Paul said himself, I have betrothed you, to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Christ is our groom, and we as Christians are his bride, right? As, as sanctified, as holy, as virgins. Yes, we were sinners and we were unholy, but we are sanctified through the blood of Christ. We were made holy through the blood of Christ. In John chapter 19, it says, Yes, blessed are those who who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb and the armies of heaven clothed in fine linen, <coughs> white and clean, followed him on white horses, it says. <coughs> they are clothed in fine linen. You know, there was a, 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 an American movie, I, I think, uh, about the wedding in, uh, in uh, Kana, Cana. And um, <coughs> it was a wedding ser feast. But it wasn't merely a wedding feast. It was a, uh, it was an engagement uh, celebration. You know, uh, for the, the 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 marriage was set, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and there there you know in these days, uh, um, you know, there's uh, you know uh, you, you know the, the date of, of of the wedding was set. Um, and as Jesus said, uh, the day of the wedding, my father does not know. Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I do not know. My only my father knows. Um, Christ said himself, "I do not know the day of the wedding. I do not know. Uh, only, only, whether it be today or tomorrow, we do not know uh, when Christ will come." And and 
and that is why you know the bride you know wearing her white dress must keep that dress clean because she does not know when that day will come you must always be prepared for the coming of christ and we're not talking about these robes or these clothes to be clean uh, to be holy uh, to be good um to be good in the eyes of god in matthew uh it says uh at the thick of night uh, someone shouted that the groom is coming and they go out to meet the groom that is why apostle paul said i am jealous for you of godly jealousy for i betrothed you to one husband um as born again christians we are likewise right we are those for whom we are betrothed we are betrothed to christ you do not know when christ will come that day is coming however that day is coming soon and very soon it could be tomorrow it could be the day after tomorrow um but that day is surely coming but apostle paul likewise said apostle paul likewise said in the same way uh, eve was tempted by satan in the same way the serpent deceived eve by his craftiness uh, that your minds may corrupt it from the simplicity that is in christ right because of the wiles of satan adam and eve are cast from the garden of eden in the same way the serpent that saved eve that same serpent that same satan is living now and he seeks to corrupt our minds from the simplicity that is in christ he cannot take away our salvation but yes he can take away the strength that we would have as an upright christian before god he can take away the strength that we would have uh uh, 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 uh in, in our sanctified life before god right he can have a christian move far away from that which is clean to that which is unclean and by doing so learn lose their conviction and their courage that is why satan seeks to plant a seed of doubt in regards to the love of god in the heart of minds of christians he seeks to separate us from the love of christ but what did apostle paul say who shall separate us from the love of christ who shall indeed separate us do you think we will fall heed to your 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 devisings? Do you think we will fall to your devisings? We I know how much God loved me. I know how much Christ loved me. Do you think I could possibly love anything else other than him? Anything more other than him? We must cast aside Satan at the get-go instead of letting him come closer and closer and closer. In James chapter 4, verse 4. It says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is in the two of God? Therefore, whoever wants whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit resides within each and every one of our hearts. And if I love something more than Christ, and you have to realize how jealous Christ will be, and that is a form of spiritual adultery in the eyes of God. Do you not know that you are making yourself an enemy of God? He's saying this to born-again Christians, not people of the world, but born-again Christians. Yes, if, if our heart towards God is diminishing, even in the slightest, that cannot be so we cannot be tempted we cannot be swayed we cannot love other things other than god it is god who forsook his life for us it is god who forsook everything for us because he loves us All right so who shall separate us from the love of christ in romans 8 likewise verse 36 it says It says, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. The slaughter. Yes, there is suffering in tribulation uh, that befalls Christians, surely. Apostle Paul, uh, when he evangelized, he went through numerous sufferings. Numerous sufferings. 
in 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 first in second Corinthians chapter eleven, we cannot possibly imagine the amount of tribulation and suffering he went through. What about the uh, the brothers and sisters of the of the early days of the church? Because of their faith, there were many who were persecuted, many who were killed. They were slaughtered. They suffered greatly. And the saints in Rome, during the time of Emperor Nero, what did Emperor Nero do with Christians? He, 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 he arrested Christians all over the city. He crucified them. And in the arena of the Colosseum, he fed them to hungry lions. If you've seen the movie Covadis, um, that's, that's that, of course the, the story is fictional, but it is based upon historical truth. That actually happened. That actually happened. Yes, they would they they would set Christians to the stake and they would let them burn all night. They made a bonfire out of Christians during the time of Emperor Nero. He burnt Christians alive for light. There are so many Christians who died and perished. And yet even when they were dying, they did not give up on their love towards Christ. They kept their love towards Christ. They did not concede in any way or form. Apostle Paul Apostle Paul right, said very plainly that not one could be separated from the love of Christ, who shall indeed separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation, suffering, or sword. No, certainly not. This could not ever be. Right, you know, you know, Christians were arrested, and if they said, "I do not love God anymore, or Christ anymore," they would let them free. But they did not even, even bow down to that. Right, and their faith in Christ was certain, and 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 they were living for that which is eternal. Do you think they were afraid of suffering? Do you think they were afraid of pain? No. They were gathered in the Colosseum and they set uh, the starving lions before them and when they, uh, they set the lions free they would rip the Christians there to shreds. Yes, Daniel was saved from the mouth of lions. But yes, God conversely yes, in this situation, let those Christians suffer. But even when they were suffering, they sang praises to God. Even when they are being burnt at the stake, those Christians sang praise to God. Yes, there was a momentary pain of death, but they had faith that there was eternal, eternal, eternal grace, eternal rewards awaiting for them in heaven. And because of that, they did not fear. They did not fear because of eternal glory. Christ loved us. Christ loves us. And he died upon the very cross for us. When we think about that love, let us be honest. Let us be honest. The sufferings that we encounter within this world are nothing. Are nothing in the sight of God. How much do we truly love God? Right? How much do we truly love Christ? And, you know, God wants us to see firsthand how that love will be revealed within our lives to be bold in the face of death to be bold in the face of death right and if he, when he sees Christians bold in the face of death that will surely be pleasing in the sight of God for if we live we live to the Lord and if we die we die to the Lord 
we die to the Lord. That is why in 2 Corinthians it says, the love of Christ has compelled us. If we live, we live to the Lord, and we die, we die to the Lord. Yes. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord. That is what Apostle Paul said. Whether I live or whether I die, I will do so for the Lord. Whether I live or die, I am of the Lord, so I will live and die for the Lord's. Right, those who are determined to die for Christ are those who can live properly for Christ. And those who live properly for Christ are those who have the right and the privilege to die for Christ. Those who fear dying for Christ are those who cannot live courageously for Christ either. Right? Uh, someone who is fearful and pitiable uh, of death. Right? Um... You know, it doesn't matter how much, you know, they, they, they may shout that they left their country. Is there anyone who believes that he has an iota of courage? Only those who are determined to die will live. And likewise, only those who have given themselves away fully are fully are those who will be able to stand. Yes, in the, in the Colosseum, when the Christians were fighting, uh, against the lions. Think about the very image of these Christians as they were dying. Let's go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22. Psalm 22, verse 12. Uh, verse 12 and 13, I will read. Many bulls have surrounded me, Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Yes, Jesus Christ, about a thousand years before his coming, David himself foresaw the death of Christ in this manner. Many bulls have surrounded me. Yes, uh, when, when the many, the, the, the Jewish authorities, the Roman soldiers, likewise, that arrested him. And it says, yes, they gape at me with their mouths like a raging and roaring lion. Like a raging and roaring lion, they gape at me with their mouths. And that is how Christ himself died. With these many bulls, those who who persecuted him, judged him, and compelled him to die. If he died in such a manner for me, can I possibly be afraid of anything? Right? Right, it be... Right, you know, when, when Christians were, were, were killed... You know, when Christians were killed, they would, in some cases, they would strip their skin away. And it would be exceedingly painful. And yet, even in their pain, they would grit their teeth and they would say, You may be stripping my skin away, but I am saved and free in the sight of God. And, you know, you know, uh, it, it says in Scripture that, yes, they did not relent from such judgment, whether they were burnt or, or, or stripped of their skin. That pain was momentary. It was nothing compared to eternal glory. Is that a special thing or is that a normal thing? Do you have confidence in that? Do you have confidence in that? You know, perhaps one day we will. I don't know. Would that be okay? I don't know what will happen in the days to come. I do not know. Right. Uh, they gape at me with their mouths and they're like a raging and roaring lion. This is still the case now. We must fight against those beasts and overcome them. And, and, and one of the first of those beasts is suffering. Uh, suffering is uh, 
Uh, suffering itself is, um, right, uh, in, in many cases comes in the form of our circumstances. At times it can be, yes, disease. And, it, and there can be many other sufferings that we encounter, of course. Um, at times our beloved family members uh, leave the world before I do. Apostle Paul went through so many sufferings. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11 from verse 23. From verse 23, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times I was shipwrecked, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils amongst false brethren." Yes, if you look at this here, this passage, the things that Apostle Paul endured and went through were you know, do you want to see how a soldier of Christ does live? This is how I have lived as a minister of Christ. Do not say anything foolish or stupid. Yes. Yes. You may not understand what I am saying to you, but do you know what I have endured as a soldier of Christ? I have been in labors more abundant. My Apostle Paul was not served every place he went. He was not served and treated well every place he went. He was beaten. Yes, he had no crime. He had committed no crimes. He wasn't, and yet he was beaten. He was beaten beyond all measure. There are many times, and yet he was left for dead. From the five times it says, I received 40 stripes minus one. Right to, right, uh, right, so, you know, they would say if, you know, 40, 40 lashes were too harsh of a punishment, so they would, in a measure of grace, only hit them 39 times, right? And yet five times he received 39 lashes. Five times he received 39 lashes. Right, one time in Lyst Lystra, he was stoned to death and he died. He was stoned and he died. And he appeared to be dead. And yet when they left his uh, body in the, in the, in the, by the roadside, he revived and came back to life. And he came back to Lystra with the brethren and sisters, and he testified of the gospel again. He said, Brethren, yes, we must endure many hardships if we are to go uh, before we enter into the kingdom of heaven. We must endure many hardships indeed. Yes. Yes. It says, three times I was shipwrecked, and night and a day I have been in the deep, in the deepest. You know, he probably thought he was die going to die and drown. In, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea. But so many perils, so many dangers he had to endure. 
and he would have died a long time ago if it had not been for the saving grace of God. And yet he went to Rome and he evangelized, and eventually in Rome he was beheaded and killed and martyred. You know, sometimes I might think, you know, why not help him? He may have been able to preach the gospel even more so, but why did you put him in chains? You know, you know, and yet when he was in chains, you know, he saw a vision of Christ telling him, strengthen, behold, you shall testify the gospel to me into Rome. You know, why not spare him from prison? Why appear to him in that place? Why not spare him from all of that pain that he had to endure? Yes. And yet, why was and yet you know James was was in prison. Yet James was first one to be beheaded. Peter was in prison, but Peter was set free. Uh, yes, and of course you know in accordance to the will of God, there are those for whom God will save and bring out of prison. There are those for whom God keeps, and lets remain. Right, uh, the suffering of Christians. What God is seeking to show us is what it means to partake in the suffering of Christians. And he gave us these examples as a result. Yes, because through the suffering of Jesus Christ, it says, learned obedience or through obedience through the sufferings that he had received. It is likewise for us. He's showing us an example of suffering. Suffering is indeed a very good thing. Why is suffering indeed a very good thing? In, in Job chapter 23, verse 10, it says, But he knows the way that I take, he knows the way that I take, for when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. In in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, right, it says, uh, For in this you greatly rejoice, so now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Uh, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Right? You know, when gold is found uh, in the, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 is, it has to be refined in the fire to be purified as to be melted and refined again. And in this process of refinement, right, all of those minerals that are in the fire that dilutes the gold can be purged and that it emerges as a nugget of pure gold. Why did God grant the suffering? Why did God grant his tribulation? For all of these, all the all the all all the all the filth, uh, so that all the filth of our flesh could be refined, so that we could refined as pure before God, so that we would be able to stand before God, and partake of the glory of God. That is why. Those who despise suffering are those who likewise despise eternity suffering is indeed a good thing yes when the church goes through suffering all those who are unbelievers fall away all those who are unbelievers fall away yes and only those christians that are set fast and faithful remain yes when when things are comfortable yes there are many many people who may come but once suffering appears once the church goes through suffering only those who are truly of faith remain Yes, when those when when yes when when gold is refined through fire, all of that, all the minerals that are mixed within the gold are refined. When we are passed through fire, right, all that is that that dilutes us is refined. It is it is the same in the church. It is same in us. Likewise, personally, suffering is indeed a very good thing, a very good thing. And the uh, <clears throat> Job uh, uh, endured the suffering that he was placed through. And later on, when Job overcame that suffering, he was refined as pure gold. He gave a testimony that 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 when he was refined he would emerge as pure gold the same is likewise for us let's go to romans chapter 5 verses 3 from verse 3 romans chapter 5 from verse 3 romans chapter 5 from verse 3 
uh, from verse 3. It says, And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance character and character hope. Yes, we rejoice in tribulations because tribulation produces perseverance, right? We can have faith to trust in God in whatever situation. It is perseverance that tests our patience, right? And through perseverance produces character and character hope. Yes, hope in eternal heaven. It makes that hope in eternal heaven much more clear. Those who do not have hope, those who do not have faith are not able to overcome sufferings. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, God, uh, God is he who seeks to refine our faith, their suffering. And he also likewise sees uh, the sincerity of our faith, likewise through suffering, right? It says suffering or tribulation, and likewise distress. Distress. Yes. So, so I believe uh, if suffering is more physical, tribulation is more physical, then distress is much more mental. Right? They can be people who are under great distress, mental duress, mental stress, mental distress, uh, per se. However, Christ, in the midst of such distress, helps us emerge victorious. Uh, when the disciples were in the great tempest, the great storm, and it seemed as if the ship would capsize at any moment that they were all drowned, right? they saw Christ walking towards them in the midst of the storm. And he said, do not fear, do not fear, it is I, do not be afraid. Yes, when you're in the midst of this sort of suffering and tribulation and distress, yes, when we are under mental distress and mental fatigue, it is Christ who walks upon that same suffering and says, do not fear, it is I, I am here. That is what Christ will say. Yes, we must endure Distress, likewise. Yes, at times, you know, it is it is God who will calm the suffering and the storm that rages within our own hearts. Shall tribulation or distress? Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? Or persecution, or famine, or persecution, it says. Now, as Christians, uh, something that Christians must, uh, must prepare for and understand is that there is indeed persecution and suffering of Christians. Yes, you may have peace, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. It is Christ who overcame the tribulation of this world. Right? It is Christ who overcame this world, and it is Christ who likewise is within us. Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, it says. Persecution. Uh, per persecution is something that Christians can obviously expect in Second Corinthians. I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter three verse twelve. It says, "All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution." The world hates Christians. Oh, don't try to be the holy person before me, you foolish person. That's what the world will say. It's very strange, but it's true. That, you know, when Christians try to live uprightly and and faithfully, they will ridicule Christians. They will bring Christians down. They will curse Christians with evil words and evil sayings. However, in the midst of such persecution, can that persecution make me fall? 
Yes, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 16 said, And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Yes, there have been so many persecutions against the church that have rage, and yet has the church, the church ever fall? No, the church is upon the rock. We likewise, we likewise are upon that rock. We likewise are upon such a foundation. And yes, shall we, shall we shiver and tremble at the face of tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril sword? No, certainly not. That is what faith is. Yes, in, in Acts chapter uh, uh, 8, when Stephen was uh, stoned to death, and there was a great persecution throughout all the churches in Jerusalem, and they were scattered across the face of the, uh, of the land, not out of fear of death, but he scattered them. There's no need for you all to be here. No, you shall preach the gospel to all of Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So he, separ- so he scattered the Christians who preached the gospel. And Christians, did they live in fear? No. Wherever they went, wherever they were scattered, they preached the gospel. They boldly proclaimed the gospel. And in all the places where they were scattered, they all preached the gospel. They all became evangelists and testified to the gospel of Christ wherever they went. Yes, suffering, distress, and tribulation, and persecution makes us stronger, makes us bolder, strengthens us when they preach the gospel of God. Uh, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or 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 famine, it says, and famine, what is famine? It is starvation. Uh, there was a great uh, famine in Jerusalem. It was very difficult for the people there. And because of this, you know, all the Gentile churches provided for the church in Jerusalem. Because the brethren in Jerusalem and the brethren in the Gentile churches loved one another. In love. Yes, Christians can become impoverished because of their faith. At times they can't starve because of their faith. At times they can be stripped bare. At times they can lose everything that they have. Yes, at times they can be made most pitiable. The world will try to make Christians pitiable. Yes. And in cold and nakedness, it says, however, they did not submit. Apostle Paul, in second, in let's go to Second Corinthians chapter eleven. Second Corinthians chapter eleven, uh, chapter eleven, verse twenty-seven. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Apostle Paul, in the midst of weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Right? He could not sleep. He starved. He was hungry. And thirsty. In fasting, exhausted, and cold, and naked. Now, as we are living our Christian lives, how much persecution have we indeed received? Have we, because of our faith, starved, been stripped bare, been unable to sleep? Has that ever happened to any of us? No. And yet the saints who were before us, this is how they suffered for Christ. And yet they did not give up on their faith before Christ. They did not give up on their love before Christ. They said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And yet when we as Christians today, when we encounter just the tiniest bit of temptation, the tiniest bit of tribulation, we fall. It cannot be so. That is a shameful thing before God. That is a shameful thing. 
No, whatever tribulation or famine or peril or sword may we may encounter, as Christians we must stand firm. Our faith cannot waver. Right? Our faith cannot waver before those things. Our faith is certain. Is it not? We must show to the world that our faith is indeed certain. The saints who were before us, even in the midst of such suffering, kept their faith, and they testified of the gospel. But as Christians, as Christians, we live our lives in such choice comforts, and yet even if the tiniest bit of suffering has come, then we think, oh, shall, what shall we do? What shall we do? And they fall. It cannot be so. Apostle Paul In Romans chapter 8. Let's go back to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Uh, verse 36, it says, As it is written, as it is written, For your sake we are killed all day long, we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Yes, we are killed all day long, and we are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And yet in all these things, it says, we are more than conquerors. Yes, in all these things. It's not to say, I have lost to some and merged victorious to others. No, it says, in all these things, even in the midst of all of these sufferings and tribulations and sufferings, in the midst of all of these things, we are much more as conquerors through him who loved us. Yes, in all these things you must pray for victory and for confidence, and in the midst of all these things we must overcome. We must, we must overcome and have much more left over in turn. This is a glorious victory. Yes, it is such a... These are such words of courage, are they not? You know, this is a life that we must live as Christians. This is this is what we must display. The sufferings and the trials and tribulations that we encounter. That is what really refines and reveals our faith. The coronavirus, this pandemic, uh, you know, of course it cannot compare to the sufferings that the Christians in the days the first and, and, and the early church encountered. But in the midst of this hardship, there are Christians who have really have kept their faith and been steadfast. And I am certain that even in the midst of greater tribulation to come, those Christians will be able to stand firmly, faithfully before God. In First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Apostle Paul said himself, Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. Yes, Christian life is a fight. It is a battle that must be fought. And we must lay a hold on eternal life, not so that we can gain eternal life, but so that we can live uh, the life of someone who has eternal life and so that we can reveal the lifestyle of someone who is indeed saved. We are those who have eternal life. The sufferings of this world are nothing in comparison to what we can and shall receive. And yet, we know how much the Christians and the saints that have come before us have suffered, and yet this light suffering, this light affliction is nothing in comparison. Are you afraid of death? Are you surely afraid of death? Of suffering? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, as it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, the glory of this world is fleeting. The suffering of this world is fleeting likewise. It is a light affliction. It is a fleeting affliction. It is a light affliction, it says in Scripture. It is so very small. And yet this affliction, this affliction, which is for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Yes, we are living towards the glory to come. We are looking at the glory to come, and that is what will give us the strength to overcome our present affliction. Yes, the things that are seen are momentary, are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. The, 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 the 
extravagance and the luxuries of this world are but for a moment. Are but for a moment. The sufferings that we as Christians encounter likewise are but for a moment. We have eternal heaven waiting for us. Let's look up one more verse together. Let's go to Song of Solomon after Ecclesiastes. Song of Solomon chapter 8. Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verse 7. Verse 7, let's read together quietly. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. This love, what is this love? This is the love of God. This is the love of God towards us. This love. Many waters cannot quench this love. Many waters cannot quench this love. Even a flood can drown out the flames of this love. They cannot do so. Even a flood cannot drown out this flood. Yes, even if a man give all for love, the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Let's say, uh, you know, a woman loves a man very dearly, and a rich man comes and gives an enormous sum of money and says, or says to, you know, love me instead of him, I'll give you all of this. Uh, 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 and, uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. You know, you've, you've heard of similar stories, right, before. <clears throat> and yet, and let's say the woman said, you know what, I have to, uh, I have to ask for, 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 for permission for my husband. And so, and, uh, and, uh, and then, and, um, you know, the rich man came to the husband and they negotiated. I'll give you, you know, 50% of what I have. And if you give me my wife, right? And, uh, and the wife went and married the rich man. They say it was a true story. I don't know if it was a true story or not. I have no idea. But there are some people who say they could have only given, they didn't have to give that much money, right? So it's a silly little story. But, you know, but there are, you know, but whether it is a someone who, whether it's a person who is being sold for money or being bought for money, it is foolish. Uh, that is the love of a person of a man, but the love of God is greater. The love of God cannot be bought for money. Even if you would give everything you have, it would be utterly despised. Yes, even if the flood, the waters of a flood come, it would not be able to quench the flames of that love, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Now for all of us here, now what is Christian life? In order for us to ask ourselves what Christian life is, there is need for us to be filled, to be spirit-filled, to be able to fight against these battles that we wage. For the time is at hand in which Christ is coming. And we must be able to stand before Christ with confidence. We must fight the good fight of faith. And we must likewise love God in the same way he has loved us. So that we will be able to testify of the gospel of God and live courageously in this time. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Our holy and merciful Father God in heaven, I thank you. Lord, I... Thank you for saving us and for having compassion upon us, we who are condemned before you. Uh, Lord, I thank you for saving us with the precious blood you spilt upon the cross and for giving us an eternal and living hope. Uh, Father, while we are living upon this world, there are many sufferings that we encounter. However, we ask that we will be able to live in accordance with the love that you have given us, so that we will be able to overcome all the sufferings that we may encounter with your love, so that we will be able to live for your glory and for your glory alone. Father God, we are so very weak. Please uphold us and keep our faith so that we will live uh, being upheld by our righteous right hand until the day of your coming. Please help us live in obedience before you uh, with unchanging hearts. I pray in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.